which is uh, given by uh, Lucy uh, McGregor. She's uh, currently the CTO of Rock Solid Images. Uh, she's a specialist in multiphysics data analysis, uh, particularly in combination, combina combining seismic, EM, and well log data. Uh, she has a PhD from the University of Cambridge um, and that works on several uh, research uh, uh, fellowships. Um, she's also been uh, working with National Oceanographic Center of Southampton. <laughs> Um, a long list here, uh, Lucy. So I'm looking forward to, <laughs> to your <laughs> talk. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about uh, also what we can mine out of well log data using machine learning. And in particular, whether we can use machine learning approaches to streamline petrophysical workflows. Um, before I start, I should um, acknowledge my co-authors. Um, both at RSI and at the Edinburgh Parallel Computing Centre in, in the University of Edinburgh, and also our sponsors, the Oil and Gas Innovation Centre, who, who are funding this, this study. Um, so, uh, just in overview, I'll start with some thoughts about why we are thinking about machine learning and why now. Um, I'll give you a quick background to the petrophysical workflows that we're interested in, and in particular to the problem I'm going to talk about today, which is the determination of mineralogy, and then leave you with some results and some thoughts and some questions. This is very much a work in progress, so some things worked quite well, some things didn't work so well, and, and I'll, I'll take you through that. Um, so machine learning has been around in geoscience for a very long time. Um, this, is, this is not new. Uh, for example, if you go back to the, the kind of early, mid-2000s, Turi Tanner came up with an approach to uh, classifying seismic attribute data called LITHAN, that's patented, um, and that allows you to take multiple volumes of seismic attributes and turn it into geology in a way that the human brain would find very hard to do. Um, so that's a, a technique that's been there for a long time, and it, it works very well. Um, more recently, we can look at prediction of properties from logs. So here's another example of some work we did quite recently, predicting vertical resistivity from a standard suite of well logs. Um, why do we want to do that, I hear you ask? Well, the reason we want to do that is that if we're doing multi-physics analysis, and that's, that's what I do a lot of, um, then uh, we need to understand electrical anisotropy, and that's not often measured. So we quite often want to predict the electrical anisotropy from, from properties that are measured. And we can do that quite effectively. This is a, a multivariate statistical way of doing it, where we've predicted uh, the vertical resistivity um, and the anisotropy based on a standard well log suite. Um, so why now? Um, what, are we, what are we doing now, and, and why is this suddenly so exciting? given that, that machine learning has been around for a while. Um, machine learning boils down in, in a lot of ways to an inversion problem. As geoscientists, we're quite good at inversion problems. We've been doing those for a long time. And people also talk a lot about big data. Um, and as geoscientists, we've been doing a lot, of, a lot of that for many years as well. So what's new? Well, really what's new is there's been an explosion of optimized libraries and approaches that we now all have access to. They're all open source. So all of this technology is now available to us in a way that it, it hasn't been until really quite recently. Um, so I'm going to show you an application today looking at whether we can improve the efficiency of petrophysical workflows um, based on training data from, from rich rock physics atlases. Um, so here is a typical petrophysics workflow. Um, <clears throat> we start with some data. Um, and there's usually some data preparation. We have to get the data into the right format, deal with the obvious problems, concatenate logs, um, find all the reports from various sources, um, start a project up. And then really the first stage is a petrophysical interpretation where we, we work out what the rock looks like. So what are the, the solid parts of the rock? What are the fluid parts of the rock? Um, what do the lithologies look like? And we can correct any obvious problems. Um, after that, we go into, from a quantitative interpretation point of view, what you might call the interesting bit, uh, which is understanding the link between geophysical parameters we can measure and the underlying rock and fluid properties. Um, now, there's an, a huge number of points in this workflow where you could potentially apply machine learning techniques to, to improve what you do or improve the efficiency of what you do. With, with what you do. I'm going to talk today specifically about the petrophysical interpretation and then specifically about one part of that. The, the prediction of mineralogy. 
So the prediction of the, the solid components of the rock, how much clay is there, how much quartz is there, how much calcite is there in that rock, can we do that given a suite of, of measured input wireline logs? Um, now, to start doing that, we need some training data. Uh, the training data needs to be consistent, um, and it also needs to be as complete as we can make it. Um, so we're starting um, for this project with our existing database of um, processed wells. So these have all been processed and interpreted by human petrophysicists um, as, as the starting point. We've got probably around 2,000 wells in the existing database. Um, we'd like to make that a much bigger database, and we're working on that. Um, but there's a few kind of questions and challenges here. Um, how much training data is enough? Is 2,000 wells enough to do what we need to do? Is two wells enough to do what we need to do? Uh, don't know. Need to work that out. Um, how regionally focused does the training data need to be? So if I want to understand or, or predict mineralogy in some wells in the Barents Sea, uh, do I need all the other wells in the Barents Sea to do it? Or do I, can I use wells from a different region? Um, a big question is how biased is the training data set? And I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about the training data set um, in, a, in a while. Um, the answer is it's really quite biased, and that's, that's actually an interesting problem. Um, and the final question is how do we deal with real data? Geoscience data is always noisy, and it's got gaps in it, and it's not what you think it is. There's always problems. And so our training data set is inherently not perfect, and we're, we have to deal with that. So. As I say, as a starting point, let's see if we can predict mineralogy. So rather than starting with 2,000 wells, that's a bit ambitious, we're going to start with 42 wells from mid-Norway um, and just look in, in, in a region. So we'll start in one area and see what we can do in, in just one area. Um, the challenges of the problem of, of mineralogy are, are various. So um, we need to predict multiple properties. It's not just a single property we're predicting. We need to predict multiple properties, the proportions of the minerals that, that are actually interrelated. Um, bias in the training data, um, as I say, that's an interesting one. There's an awful lot of quartz and clay out there, a lot of quartz and clay. Um, that's mostly what you see in wells. There's much less of the other minerals that are, that are still important. There's much less calcite and pyrite and coal around. So the data set, the, the training data set, is actually inherently biased because the earth is inherently biased. Um, and that has quite a big effect on, on the results that we see. Um, how do we deal with non-uniqueness and uncertainty? Um, we, we want to make a prediction. Uh, we want to know how good that prediction is as well. So how do we deal with uncertainty? And then finally, which algorithm should we use? Um, we've tried several. Um, like the previous talk, there are many options out there, and, and really we, 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 you just have to look around and see what works best. So we tried a simple Dirichlet re regression first. That didn't work very well at all, so we stopped doing that. Uh, we tried a multilayer perceptron. That didn't work terribly well. Our current second favorite is a, a deep neural network. Um, we were using the PyTorch library, um, and that worked quite well. Our current favorite is XGBoost, so boosted trees. Um, and the reason we like that is because it's fairly robust to gappy data. It can deal with gaps in the data and imperfect data much more efficiently than some of the other libraries out there. Um, so that's what we've used uh, in what I'm going to show you. Um, one of the issues with the boosted trees approach is it's very dependent on hyperparameters. Um, so uh, there are about seven hyperparameters you have to tune uh, for XGBoost or for boosted trees. Um, they all have a physical meaning of some description, but because they're interrelated, the best way to optimize them is empirically. Um, so we use the HyperOpt uh, library to search through parameter space to understand what the best um, hyperparameters uh, hyper were for this problem. Um, I've given you the hyperparameters at the bottom, um, but really the, 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 the main issue with this is that that's actually quite a big computational problem. And the optimization in HyperOpt is not terribly good. So we had to extend um, the parallelization to allow us to run the parallelization um, and extend it from being able to search about 72 parameters a day to about 20,000 parameters per day in order to get that optimum set of hyperparameters. So let me show you some answers. Um, here's the first test. Uh, so this is kind of, if you like, the perfect test. Uh, test on a single well. So take one well bore. Uh, it's this well here, just chosen randomly. 
Um, within that well, we divide uh, the, the data set up, so we take 80% of the points to train on, and then we predict the remaining 20% in that single well. So as a training data set goes, this is as good as you can get. Um, so let's do that. Here are our input curves, so gamma ray, neutron porosity, resistivity, density, VP, and VS. And if we do that test on a single well, uh, then we're predicting quartz, clay, and calcite here. Um, black is the measured log, uh, or not measured, I, I should say human interpreted log. Red is the predicted log. Um, and we do pretty well. So, so far, so good. That's not bad, um, as you would expect with a, an almost perfect training data set. And if we look at the distribution of the differences, you can see it's nicely distributed around zero, zero mean in the difference. Uh, so we do pretty well, and we can illustrate that again by cross-plotting, uh, in this case, the predicted versus the um, human interpreted values of quartz, clay, and calcite. It should fall along a line of y equals x. Um, for quartz and clay, it does pretty nicely. Uh, calcite doesn't do as well, and I think that's because there's just much less calcite in the training data. It just doesn't know how to, how to train for that uh, mineral so easily. Um, so, so far, so good. On a single well, we do quite well. Um, what happens now if we try and predict across wells? Um, so in this case, um, once again, I'm just choosing a random well and then training on the remaining 41 wells and predicting quartz, clay, and calcite uh, on, on my test well. Um, so in this case, we do pretty well. Um, black is the human-interpreted curve. Red is the uh, machine-interpreted curve. Um, and uh, they're, they're pretty close. They're, they're not doing too badly. Um, and once again, if you look at the distribution of differences, the mean is about zero with a, with a, a distribution around it um, for all three minerals. Um, another quite nice way of looking at this is to look in elastic cross-plot space. Um, ultimately, I'm a geophysicist, so I quite looking at, like looking at elastic cross-plot spaces. So this is acoustic impedance versus Poisson's ratio, color-coded by clay and quartz. Um, for the original log on the, the left and the predicted log on the right. Um, and you can see not only are you, you recovering the trends, but you're also recovering the clustering in the data. So the different, the different uh, fascist types are being recovered by the model. Um, so that's great. And um, in a number of places in this data set, you get results like that. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work. Um, so here's another example where the result isn't so good. Um, interestingly, it's quite good at the top of the well. Um, it's quite good when we're in the more shaly section, uh, but then we get into a sandier section and it goes horribly wrong. Um, so why is that? Um, there's a few things to note here. Um, you'll note that actually, if we look at the clustering again in, in elastic cross-plot space, we've got um, two clear clusters, a kind of shaly area and a kind of sandy area. And the model actually sees that. It sees that you've got two clusters. It just doesn't get the extremes right. Um, so we don't predict the high quartz content in the lower part of the well. And that's reflected in the very bimodal distribution of the, 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 the differences. Um, so what's going on and what do we do about it? Um, we've had a number of... of um, approaches to trying to solve this problem of, of having very good predictions in some places and complete failures elsewhere. Um, what I'm going to show you are the, is the result of looking at the effect of training data on this. Um, so what we did is we took a test well and then we gradually added training wells to it. So we start with one well, the closest well, and then we add a second one and then we add a third one. And every time we predict, in this case, uh, clay content and quartz content, um, and uh, look at how accurately the, the model, or how accurate the model can predict the data um, as we add training data in. So let's step through this. Um, what we have here is the result for one training, data, one training well. So I've taken one well for training and predicted uh, the nearby test well. Um, and we don't do very well at all. So um, as before, black is the human interpreted version, red is the machine interpreted version. Um, and it's not very good. So that's what you might expect. There's not nearly enough training data to build an accurate model. Um, add another well in. So this is the second closest well. Um, it gets slightly better in terms of quartz prediction. Actually, the clay prediction go gets even worse. So we're still not doing very well here. Um, add a third one. Um, now, suddenly, we're starting to do a bit better. 
Um, it's improving somewhat with the, the addition of the third well. And if we add a fourth well, uh, now we're getting somewhere. Both the quartz prediction and the clay prediction um, are not perfect, but they're, they're pretty good. Um, and you start to see your, your differences distributed around zero. Um, so we can continue adding wells. Um, and the problem with that is it doesn't get better, and indeed it actually gets slightly worse. Um, so uh, that's not really what we wanted to see. Um, just to look at what's happening, you can plot the RMS difference between the, the, the human interpreted and the machine interpreted values. So that's a, a fairly bulk measure of difference, but it's, it's just a, a nice illustration. And you can see that for both the quartz and the clay, the RMS difference goes down until you reach about four wells, and then it kind of plateaus. Um, another interesting point to note is that occasionally you add a well and there's a jump. It gets worse. So occasionally when you add a well, something goes wrong. And indeed, if you take those wells out, so now I've just removed this well from the training data set, now it asymptotes at about four wells but, but stays pretty flat. Um, so the question is, what's, what's this well? What's the problem with that well? Uh, the answer is that that well is on a completely different depth trend to everything else that was in the training data set. Uh, so it's a different geology, different history, and, and it's not helping. It's not helping the training process. Um, so what does this tell us? <coughs> well, what it tells us is that if we want to train a specialized model, so something that will very specifically answer a question local to a well, then probably about four wells in similar geology is what you need in order to get a, a decent result. Um, however, what we'd like to do is train a general model. And if we want a generalized model, um, either, either and, uh, we need to improve the feature set that we're using um, so that we can reduce the non-uniqueness in the problem, or and or um, increase the size of the training data set significantly. 42 wells doesn't cut it. Maybe we do actually need a few hundred or a few thousand in order to, to cover the range of possibilities that we're seeing in the data. Um, so just to sum up, um, can we use machine learning to streamline workflows? Um, yes, the results are promising. Um, they're not perfect, but it's certainly a direction that, that looks like it's going to do something useful. Um, there's a lot we need to understand. We need to understand the effect of training data, and we need to understand how general a model we can build given the training data that's available to us. Um, a question to ask then is, is how good a model do we need? It doesn't need to be perfect to be useful. In fact, none of our models as geoscientists are ever perfect. Um, we're always approximating. Um, so the question actually is not how good, is, how good does it need to be, it's, it's how good does it need to be to be useful to us in an interpretive process. Um, an interesting point here is that we're comparing a machine interpretation against a human interpretation. So if they don't agree who's right, um, do we, is it, are we arrogant enough to think that we're always correct? Maybe not. <laughs> so we need to understand who's right. Um, core is really the only ground truth we've got in that, and we need to bring that into the analysis. Um, so finally, what we're doing next, as I say, this is very much a work in progress. Um, we're working on refining the model. We're working on refining the features that go into the model. Um, but I hope at some point I'll be able to come back and talk to you about uh, a more accurate prediction of mineralogy. Thank you. Thank you to Lucy for an excellent talk. So we still need uh, petrophysicists. And oh, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Hi. Uh, very interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. I had uh, one suggestion. Maybe, um, maybe I didn't get it, but um, one typical thing you, you always do, or I was told, is that you use the caliper lock as a quality measure of the locks. So I don't know if that talk and the previous maybe uh, maybe you did that, of course, and then uh, I didn't catch it. The other thing I was wondering is the training data. So in yours, it looked like it was derived from the locks itself. Um, and then I'm wondering, so if you derive the training data from locks, and then you create a machine learning model which derives also data from locks, what is sort of the, <coughs> the big step up? Um. Yes, absolutely. We, we look at caliper to assess quality. So I didn't say that, but yes, that's part of the process. Um, 
so the question of, of are we using derived logs to derive more logs um, is actually quite interesting. We've, we've, our, our initial aim was to use as raw a log as possible. So the ideal would be you download it from the MPD website, run it through something clever, and out comes all this stuff that we can then start interpreting. Um, what we found, though, was that, that um, there are enough quality problems in those raw logs that it's worth fixing them first. So we're using logs that have been through a, a high-level kind of QC process to deal with the obvious problems. Um, we're not using a fully processed log. Um, but the goal is to try and, to try and use as raw a log as we can and still get a sensible answer. One of the things we need to do at the moment, as I say, we've been, we've been concentrating on the, the, the kind of absolutely standard logs you see everywhere. Um, I think we're going to have to start bringing in some of the, the, the more specialist logs and also mud logs and core and all the other information that a, that a human petrophysicist uses when they're doing this sort of interpretation. There's a wealth of other information, unstructured data, that somehow needs to come in here to, to help with the process because that's what a human uses. Thank you. Lucien, rock solid uh, images.